Welcome to the Perspectives Podcast. Joe Sway here. Uh, as most of you guys probably already know by now, I'm a fellow believer um, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, attended the Oral Roberts University, where, anyways, um, and, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we're sitting here today with Mr. Chase Brown himself. He's a native of Texas. Texas, right? Texas is his own oh, country yeah. from what I hear. Uh, he attended University of North Texas. He's an Inspiring philanthropic creative, and it's 2021, and he still loves long walks on the beach. Why that is, I have no idea, but we'll get into that today. Chase, how you doing? Hey, man, I'm doing well, especially considering uh, we're going out to LA soon. We are. That's I'll be I able heard. to get those walks in on the beach. That's true. First That's time true. in a minute, but it's actually funny. Uh, our roommate Josiah at the townhome, he was uh, on Monday night, was like, Hey, you want to turn on the state of the state address? And then for Texas and posted it on social media and a couple of his friends up in Boston were like, man, y'all wilding down there. Oh, <laughs> y'all yeah. are basically your own country. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, pretty much. What state has a state of the state address? That's so, interesting. It's funny, but how are you, bro? I'm good, man. Um, temperature's starting to change, so the birds are starting to come out again and the sun is shining, so yep. it's a good time. But enough about us. Uh, you guys probably already know. Uh, whenever we have the podcast, we try to bring on special guests. And today, we brought you guys a man that's very knowledgeable about many things. And so we'll be able to get into that today. Um, so I practiced your name earlier, and now it's just slipped my mind. Um, <laughs> Come on, so best guest. Huh? Best guest. I don't right want to do that to our guests. Here we Chase. go. Um, okay, Pastor, is it? Ooh, Lord. Um, we're going to edit this part out, right? <laughs> no, I might have to leave you out here. <laughs> oh, man. I am drowning right now. I need help. Ne- uh, Nebi KO? No, 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 no. Is it Nebi A? Nebi A. Kalele? Yes. There, Kal- we, there Kalele. we go. Yeah. But if you want to say it again, because I mispronounced that. Nebi A so. Kalele. There, there it goes. You got Pastor it, man. Neb, how's it going? It's good, man. Yeah. It's, it's great to be uh, on the perspectives. There it goes. Yeah. Yeah. First time, and uh, appreciate what y'all doing. And, with uh, what all I've had a chance to hear uh, mm. about the the mission and uh, what's what's behind this, and I'm excited to be on. Yeah, so I've over quarantine, um, mm. I discovered a new world of Habesha people. Okay, for those of you that know what Let's that go. is, I'll explain that later. Um, so I've known Erm since September of 2018. Yeah, he's the only Ethiopian I knew in the state of Texas. And quarantine we had him on the comes podcast. around. We had him yeah. on the podcast earlier. Quarantine comes around. I joined this thriving small group, and now there's just Ethiopians everywhere, <laughs> you know. And and you're like that common person for a lot of them that are here in the Dallas, Texas area. So it's a cool connection there. So um, yeah, yeah, it's amazing, and it's something that a couple of our other guests we've had on the past, like David Miranda yep. and others, know you and friends with you. You've only been here for a couple of years as well, yeah. so you're leaving a good footprint He's already. A great guy. Mm-hmm. So you want to share just a little bit about, you know, what you do, who you are, and everything like that in the Dallas yeah, area? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was I was born in Ethiopia, but mm-hmm. I came at a very young age with the family uh, to the States, and when we came, uh, we came immediately to Cal- California, Northern California, and I pretty much grew up in Northern California. Mm-hmm. Um, grew up in a Christian home. Uh, parents knew the Lord, loved the Lord, and uh, so I grew up hearing the gospel, didn't come to faith in Christ or become a Christian until I was in college. Mm-hmm. So it was really, truly university where I, I found uh, my faith uh, personally, and then from that point onward, just started that journey as a young adult, uh, just trying to figure out myself, identity, know my purpose, get anchored, and just try to figure out what what I'm supposed to be doing here. Right. Um, so I answered the call to the ministry and uh, around 23, and at that point, I at least 
began orienting myself toward, okay, what is, if, if this is what I sense God's calling me to do, what's that going to look like on a practical level, Mm -hmm. right? I was doing pre-med and uh, some other things around that time. And that's where I, I transitioned from. Shortly after that, I found a great church, plugged myself in there. I was at that church from the time I came to Christ for the next 12, 13 years of my life. Mm -hmm. And it's there where I answered, I figured out my calling, identity, purpose, community, everything. And, um, Close to about 24, 25, uh, I found the love of my life, who's, who's my wife. <laughs> there we go. Uh, everybody's got that story yeah, right. that in there, yeah. right? So um, he what, uh, who is my wife of uh, going on 14 years mm. now. And so we got married um, in our early, mid-20s. And we have four children between us, uh, three girls and a boy. And whom we love greatly, and we've been in ministry uh, together. I've been pastoring and preaching for 15 years. Mm. Um, About two and a half years ago, um, I transitioned myself out of California to Dallas, um, having met great people, uh, churches, uh, leadership, uh, networks that all kind of came together Mm -hmm. in God's providence to be able to make. Uh, this transition of ours from California to Texas happened. Right. And so we've been here just working away, uh, just pouring into lives, um, looking to see people meet Jesus and, and grow in their relationship with Christ and right. establish, see a, a community over time established that we would be able to leverage for, for, for mission purposes locally and abroad. Um, so I'm, I'm pastoring uh, currently Pathway City Church. Okay. And... Um, it's there where um, I'm involved with a great group of, of, of people who love Jesus and uh, are passionate about seeing other people know Christ. Mm. And, it, and if my math serves me correctly, you were in Cali for how long? Uh, gosh, I, I since three years since old. Three. Okay, so more than 15 years? Uh, more than more 15, 15 years. years. Okay. <laughs> and you've yeah. been in Texas for about two years? Yeah, going on three. Going on yep. three? Okay. Yep. Uh, now, there's a great debate. This has nothing to do with the podcast, but um, <laughs> there's this Cali, Texas uh-huh. thing that, that happened. So, someone I have who has, no interest in Cal- no interest? Californianizing uh, <laughs> okay. uh, Texas okay. <laughs> okay. for all my uh, Texas folk. But we got to go on this side debate also. So, and you can make your answer short, whatever you want In and Out or Whataburger. That's a great question. Is that going to make or break this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we got people listening, Cali yeah. and Texas. I, I, I'd yeah. say so. in and out, in and out. Ooh, okay, okay. In and okay. out. We'll, we'll let you have your opinion. That's yeah. different. Yeah. That's all good. That's yeah. all good. I wouldn't have gone there personally, but that's Can we okay. say Chick-fil-A? <laughs> yeah. Hey, praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. I'm right there. But awesome. Appreciate that introduction. Definitely. You're you're an awesome guy around the Dallas area mm-hmm. and making a great impact. Know a lot of people. Know a lot of similar people of us. And so we're excited to have you on, um, but let's go ahead and dive right into it. Let's do it. Yeah. You're a man of many leadership positions in the Dallas area. You mentioned one of them. You have a couple others. You're being humble. I get it. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> but so for you, um, whenever I first met you back in 2018, uh, you were sharing a message of time management mm. and just kind of sharing how we can honor the Father with our time, how mm. we can honor others and really have quality over quantity. So What are some time management tips that you would share for people who are either kind of doing, you know, a full-time job and a side hustle or young adults who have a whole bunch of things that they desire to do in life and aren't really sure what they exactly want to do? Um, Because I know that's something that (laughs) I'm looking for. Definitely. Mm. Definitely. No, it's a great question, Chase. I would start out, um, I could say a ton of things, but I would start out first by saying you really got to be mindful of the season of the your life that you're you're presently currently in, uh, okay. because my notion of time management has changed and evolved over time. For example, like when I was in my twenties, single, no kids, um, largely a student, it looked like one thing. The moment yeah. um, I committed myself to a, a a relationship, an intimate relationship, and began to um, pair off and transition into potentially marriage, it looked different. Once we brought a child or two or three in, it looked another way. Yeah. And then once these kids started growing up, we're entering into teenage years now, they're in <laughs> middle school and high school, it looks even more differently, right? Yeah. And so I think I think the first thing is, is there's really no, I can share a little bit of mine, which I, I probably will in a second here, but I think everybody listening has to be sure, be mindful of 
take what principles can be gleaned, but don't necessarily try to match yourself up to somebody else because everybody else has their own lane, their own season of life. And so um, what I would say is uh, when it comes to time management, it's critical because you can't really do anything about time. Mm. I mean, it's fixed. Um, And so as far as time management goes, um, one thing I like to do is um, honor the way my day starts and the way that my day ends. Mm, that's that's critical. Because you don't really have any control. I know nobody could see me, but you don't really have any control over what's going on in the middle of the day. Right. You're pretty much reacting to everything mm. that's going on and you're trying to figure out how to deal with what you're being thrown the best way you can. Right. Right. But as far as the way your day starts and the way your day winds down, that is within your control. Mm. And I believe mm. if you can crush it there you set yourself up in a very advantageous position to be able to get more wins throughout the course of the middle part of your day. Yeah. So one thing I, I do is, is I, you know, like I said, I'm married, I got four kids. So um, I personally, as a, as a pastor, as a father, as a husband, my time is already taken. I don't want to take away from my family more than they deserve, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what that means is, um, I could I could only take time from certain places before they wake up, uh, when they're awake and they could have my time, or um, after they go to bed, right? So I realize I don't want to take any more time from them. So what I do is I, I get up early, uh, as early as possible. So I'm the first person up, and that's precious time because that's time where I can charge. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's time where I can practice meditation. That's time where I can get into God's word and pray. That's time where I can orient myself toward the day and just be the right person to face whatever is going to hit me. Right. Um, that way it doesn't matter what my day looks like. I did what was necessary. Right. Yeah. Um, throughout the day, of course, um, what I like to do is, I, um, I borrow this time blocking. Mm-hmm. So I'm big on time blocking. Uh, it's a planner. So instead of basically having a top down to do list, I block out my time. So if you could imagine a piece of paper with blocks with a, a grid, I block out my time. So the day before I'm looking at the day and I'm seeing, OK, what meetings already exist that are already in the books? OK, I block those out. I actually put rectangles or squares depending on how much time that takes. Okay. Right? I block that out and I may even give it a title like meet with so and so, lunch with so and so. Right. Or if it's a staff meeting podcast with these two crazy exactly. dudes, yeah. that's blocked in, that's blocked in, <laughs> yeah. right. That's blocked in. And so I block that out and I imagine how long can I say that would take me and mm-hmm. I'll create a size of a square that long and there'll be time uh, stamps on the sides. Right. I block that out. Another block would be I even block out instant messaging, mm-hmm. communication, emails and so forth. I'll give that time. I won't allow myself to interact with that parallel with the things that I need to do. The reason why is I'm big on what Cal Newport talks about is uh, deep work. So I, I really, you know, in order to do sermon preparation, research, study, prayer, and really working on things that require like demanding attention, especially if your audience has that kind of work in front of them. It's not just busy work. Yeah. Um, you can't be doing juggling multiple things at the same time. So I need to carve out space. So if I want to do two hours of deep work, I'll say, you know what, Zen, if I know I got this meeting and this demand at this time, then I want to send, set this time at this time of the day for this sort of deep work. Right. Yeah. And I block that out. So what that does is it gives me control of my day. Um, and so basically, when I look at any given day, uh, daily schedule, you basically have a bunch of top down vertical blocks, squares or rectangles, uh, whether it's lunch, uh, a meeting, um, sermon, in my case, sermon preparation, if somebody's a coder and they need to code for quite a while, or if somebody's an architect or they need to draft, you know, yeah. if you're an artist, if you're an author and you need to write, right. yeah. knock out a number of pages, right? Whatever that case may, or a podcaster, you have to research for your up and coming episode, mm-hmm. right? You, that's deep work, right? So you want to block that out and then you can work everything else around it. So okay. it gives you control over your day. Mm-hmm. Another thing that I'm big on is I have startup rituals for my work and I have uh, shutdown rituals. 
Okay. And I got this from Michael Hyatt, and I use that in my full focus planner. So my startup rituals will be, this is what I do when I first arrive. So I already talked about what I do early in the morning. Mm -hmm. That's at home. Yeah. That's before I get to the office at, let's say, if we want to use a, a number, uh, 9 a.m. Yeah, something okay? like that. So my startup rituals may be I can greet the first few people that I see next door to my office. Um, I can check an email. I can check, you know, um, a few a few tasks. And those are my startup rituals. So mm -hmm. it gets me going. Now that's behind me. I can focus. My shutdown rituals are... What do I need to do to make sure that when I get home with my family, I'm not dealing with that humming anxiety Yeah, you know, of, of an email I need to craft and still respond to, um, a project that I feel like I haven't given enough time to that's just nagging me or mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, an idea that I'm churning. I, I've, I've, I've been there. And even though I left work, I'm still dealing with people, counseling sessions, the interactions that took place or whatever. And I noticed my family could get worn out by the fact that I'm not all with them. And so I, I realized I never had a shutdown ritual. Mm -hmm. And so shutdown rituals are great because it allows me to really go through a series of things that typically are the things that bug me or that weigh on me. Um, that I can kind of bring some sort of closure to. So that means it's either something that needs to get done, that can get done, so I'll do it mm -hmm. before I, I leave and shut down, or it's something that needs to be deferred, so I'll defer it, okay. right? And I, that way, at least I'm doing something with it. There's some task. Mm -hmm. So anytime that sort of feeling begins to arise while I'm at home with the kids and with the fam, I can always tell myself, no, 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 no. you did something about that. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry. Right. You went through that process. So, so it, it helps me to create that work life balance, mm -hmm. if you will. So, um, time management would, for me would look like that. I, I, I always have up to three major things that I try to have in view that I really would like to accomplish before the day is done. Everything else is not as big as those three major things. Mm -hmm. So some people like to refer to them as big rocks, little rocks, right? So I try not to make, give everything the same number and the same weight. And I try to find out of all of the things that could potentially be done in the day, what are the three major things that if you can accomplish those, that would make that day worthwhile. Okay. And, I, and I try to create that sort of separation right. and and prioritize my day accordingly. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, <laughs> as you were kind of talking, I'm thinking about myself um, in comparison, mm. uh, how I build my schedule. And I'm like, not even close. <laughs> like, yeah. it, it doesn't look close. I mean, that's so structured. And uh, it wasn't until about maybe two, three years ago when I even started using my calendar. Mm. I'm like, man, this thing's actually kind of useful. <laughs> you know, um, before yeah. I just kept everything in my head and things just kept being slipped and missed yeah. and all that. So, yep. um, and, I, and in going and speaking to uh, your congregation that you mentioned, Pathway, yep. I believe, and uh, some of the things you might do, like greeting people that are there. Um, in terms of being in a position of leadership, being a pastor, how do you go about finding those leaders that may help you out with certain things to where you might not need to worry about if this is taken care of, this isn't taken care of? Like, how do you go about finding leaders within a church when, um, you know, we're all spiritual people? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, that's something that we're actively trying to work on is just like that delegation, that building that trust, finding that potential, things Good like words. that. Yeah. yeah. Those are those are words I would use. You guys are already getting at it. Um, I think ultimately, you know, it really boils down to relationship, right? Mm. And so um, it's interesting because, you know, leadership at the end of the day is influence, mm. in my estimation. And um, I think the first place you begin is by being the best version of the leaders that you want. So you start with yourself, right? And what's interesting is... is um, people have a tendency to aspire to whatever the ideal is within any given context. Yeah. Right. So if you're in jujitsu and you walk, you gauge the gymnasium in the room, you're, you're, it's, it's going to be apparent if you're on the hoop court, right. It's going to be apparent, mm -hmm. right. If you're in, in the work environment on the floor or in right. the department, it's going to be evident. Right. And I think also in the context, in other words, um, 
It could be either in terms of something that's embodied in mm-hmm. someone, or it could be in terms of what is often celebrated and talked about. Mm-hmm. That could be the ideal, mm-hmm. right? So every so um, when that whatever is promoted, if that's if if that's promoted, people have a, a tendency to begin to emerge. We almost naturally are there. I think what you're doing, really, as far as what your part is, is you're just cultivating. Mm-hmm what's 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 already there you're and so we can either be bad stewards or good stewards of these potential leaders right but uh, but they kind of naturally emerge mm-hmm. and part of your job is to identify them recruit them create space for them and and develop them mm. to make sure that they can be the best version of themselves right right so the the real it's not so much about finding them it's it's how do you make sure you don't miss them, mm. right? Because they're there. So I start with the assumption that they're there. And, and how do we make sure that we don't miss them? And sometimes one of the ways we can miss them is just by missing them. But right. I think another way is sometimes depending on people's upbringing, they may have a negative way of viewing themselves. Mm-hmm. So they could bury a lot of that. And part of your job is to call, call that forth mm-hmm. and to trust in them to a degree. You know, your name may be Cephas, but you will be Peter, mm-hmm. right? So, right. Um, I think I think that's also important. I think another is um, get to know the mm-hmm. people that are around you, and you see how they've already handled um, degrees of responsibility in their own circles, and if if that gives you an idea as far as what it would look like if you were to put this person in a position of of leadership. So I think a lot of times you're going off of whatever you, what little or what more you may have uh, that you can see with that, with that person. Mm. And then from there um, you go, I think another is you create pipelines. I think that's important. I think you need to have some sort of a leadership cohort, leadership development space, where people, if they're interested and willing, if they're in there, they're going to be exposed to resources, the, the sort of things that m- develop people. Right. Right. So I think that that system, whatever you want to call it, could not only help people assess themselves. It's like, OK, I think I got what it takes. But it also, if they see that they have a desire for leadership, it also, I think, provides everything that they're going to need uh to be able to 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 develop Mm. um yeah 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 and i I really love that pipeline idea and just creating those opportunities to be able to identify like the faithfulness the obedience and like the potential in people um because it's something that i've been feeling over the last (sighs) probably six months to a year or so is that I I have a whole bunch of people in, in my life, like Joshua, like Yvonne, like a whole bunch of people who are really talented, really faithful, and are all doing kind of their own things. And their leadership, they're, they're leaders in their own areas. And so then from there, in like us leading an organization, it's just kind of like, all right, well, I know all these awesome people that are off doing their own things. But right now I don't really know anybody that potentially that I've seen that potential in that would be, that would have that time to potentially join our, and come alongside our vision and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so it's a problem that I'm trying to solve for is like, okay, like how do I find these people who have this either developed or untapped potential that either aren't, already off doing their own things and doing something with that talent and pursuing the calling that the father's given them or that, um, you know, would be willing to come alongside in unity with us in that. Cause that's something I'm trying to figure out right now that like, I definitely love that idea. Yeah. As far as delegation is concerned, um, there needs to be alignment because delegate delegation requires trust. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So you're not there right. if you're delegating. So you need, there needs to be trust, in my estimation, a few th- four things. Trust, honor, shared vision, and shared values. Um, yeah. I like to use the analogy of like even looking in a marriage, 
<laughs> My mind was literally right yeah, there. <laughs> yeah, for real. Because because think about it. It applies. Um, I'm not at home right now. Mm-hmm. I've delegated authority uh, to my wife. She has it when I'm there, but she she's the only one there now with the four kids. Mm-hmm. Why am I at ease? Mm. Because there's trust, right? And there's honor, right? She honors me, honor her. I know that she's not speaking about me behind my back mm. to the kids, feeding them with all sorts of toxicity and negativity, yeah. mm-hmm. right? right? There's a sense in which I know that the home is together and that whatever the exchanges are, they're, they're healthy and they're, and they're good. And there's a shared vision where we see we have the same picture mm. of our future, right. our family's future in mind. And when you got the same picture, you don't need to be there. When you don't have a shared vision, you got to be all over it right. because it's only in your head. Mm. That's why you can't delegate it. Mm-hmm. But once it's in, it's in more heads than just yours, mm-hmm. then you don't need to be there. Right. Mm-hmm. The Definitely. vision takes over mm. and their shared values. In other words, the things that matter to her and trouble her are vir- virtually the same as the things that matter to me and trouble me. And therefore, I can trust her with whatever daily decisions based on values that need to be made for our, our kids or our, our home. Right. Because yeah. we 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 grew the same. Right. And I think in the same way, like the church or a community or, you know, on one level, it's relationship. You're a family. There's some familial level. Right. And I think when you get to that place where you need to delegate, it's the work that you've put in that lets you know whether you deserve so it's almost, it's not a right. It's a privilege to be able to get at a place where you can. That's why you need to put in the work early on in, in an entity's developmental stage, right? If it's a church plan, it's, it's just a core group and you're just beginning to know each other and understand what it looks like to church, plan to church. Yeah. If you're a business, whatever, you're just beginning to pitch to one another the idea of the need for a business like this in the community, right? And so you don't need too much structure. You don't need too many systems. It would kind of look weird. You're too small. Right now, it's all about relationship. We're family. It, it even has that family feel. Mm. This is where you have the chance to grow in these areas and develop these areas. And I think that's why it's not just about shuffling paper and so forth. It's, it's really spending a lot of time with people over meals or just coffee or interactions. And any chance you can get, you're talking about these things. Right. And, and this culture will naturally be be created and there's no problem with delegating. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So then just one quick follow up off of that. Um, so then for someone who is in the process of delegating process of developing that trust and is getting ready to kind of let them let that individual that they're delegating to go do that responsibility or go do that part of the business for the first time. And they, that maybe that trust isn't fully developed yet. What encouragement would you give someone who looks at that and is just like, you know, I'm kind of scared of this risk right now. Cause I'm not sure if even these conversations that we had beforehand or these times kind of doing it collectively is going to carry over. Like what encouragement would you give someone to overcome fear in that? Is it just simply like, Hey, you don't need to be afraid of failure because the father's got you. And at the end of the day, like his plans are good. Even if like this first time around Mm -hmm. it fails Mm -hmm. or maybe is there something like deeper alternative to that? Well, I'm all for risk. Um, Just calculated risk. That's all. I I, I think there's a, such a thing as foolish risk. Mm. So, um, but even calculated risk, you know, <laughs> is not easy. Mm, yeah. right? That's a challenge. And so we all need encouragement even in that. Um, I think if there are flags because um, the relationship is premature and yet you feel the need to have to entrust someone with a degree of responsibility that you just feel like the relationship doesn't deserve or hasn't earned or is not there yet, then I think you should note that that's probably telling you something, right? Because sometimes the business or the the organization, it can get ahead of us. 
we there are a lot of pieces that are outside of our control, like a church, for example. What happens if like there's revival? Or what happens if you know 300 people come through the doors one week and they want to stay around? Right. It's not just one day, you know. Yeah. And now you you haven't been able to scale your leadership team to that new right. number. Right, you, you, the ratio is going to be out of whack, right? So there's going to be a lot of there's so a lot of times there's there's certain things. Now, if it's within your control, then obviously you want to seize the moment, the season, and recognize. Look, growth can potentially occur. Mm-hmm. In my mind, no doubt it will. So I had better be ready for to steward that. Mm. And the only thing, way I can be ready to steward that is by having the, the kind of relationship with the people around me that will allay those sort of fears that I may have, mm. right? And even just in, in talking about this, uh, you were saying something earlier and it brought the thought up. Um, we kind of see in Acts chapter one, um, Peter and the disciples are talking. He's like, yo, uh, what's his name? What's that guy? Judas. You know, Judas was among us, but he did what he did. Mm. Now we're going to cast lots between Barnabas and Matthias. They did that and they picked Matthias, right? That's the only time, Matthias, 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 not Matthias. <laughs> yeah. Tomato, Matthias. tomato, tomato. Right. <laughs> and, and that's literally the only time that you hear his name again, mm. right? Um, so in light of that, and then also there's moments where um, favoritism just kicks in, right? It's like, oh, I like this person. This person's nice to me in picking, you know, whoever the person is. So favoritism can pick in, yeah. making kick in. And there's yeah. also that point of us just, quote unquote, casting lots. Right. But then you see how God chose Paul. Yeah. Right. So how do we as leaders, how do you as a leader um, avoid just our human way of doing things and casting lots or just having favoritism over somebody and truly tapping into, OK, this is who God has for this job. And obviously not everybody works within the concept of a church. It could be picking somebody for a business position, a business role or a teacher, whatever it might be. Right. Yeah. Just in different aspects. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Typically, you want to look at how the person has already demonstrated themselves in terms yeah. of their character and their competency. What sort of track record do we have here, right? Re- what's their resume, if you will? Like, what what are they known for? And I think you want to look at that because the title doesn't do anything, right? So we want to, you know, we want to make sure that. All we're doing is we're confirming what's already there. Mm. We don't create anything by virtue of giving someone a new title. Right. So I think that's important as well is um, y- you want to see the kinds of ingredients that are supposed to be there in somebody's life um, that give, it doesn't mean that it's there in full, it could be there in seed form, mm. it could be there to some degree, and there could be all sorts of explanations as to why it's not anywhere else. Um, but there has to be something there. I think within the church context also, not only do you want to see that, is you want to get an idea um, if you pitch the idea of that person's name to the people. Unless you can kind of suspect that, what would they think mm. if they found out tomorrow that this person is now occupying this position. Right. Because you're not a leader in a vacuum. You're always a leader in relationship to other people. Mm. And therefore, your position has to be valued in the eyes of the people that are going to have to spend a lot of time around you, maybe even under you, Mm -hmm. right? And so if they have great justifiable issue Mm -hmm. off the bat with this potential person then it's like, what am I missing? Yeah. Am I out of touch with my group, my, my circle, right? Um, and what is it about my circle, the people around me, mm-hmm. um, that they can teach me that I apparently, even as a leader, am out of, out of touch with, right. right? So sometimes you have to see, you know, I know if I'm g- going to put leaders is I want to know, it's like, okay, I already know this person already has influence, and they've been occupying that influence, enjoying that influence on a very lay level, mm. informal level, unofficial level. Mm-hmm. So it's no problem for me to want to now f- formalize it, right. make it a little bit more official because they're it. Mm. Whether they're given it or not, they're it. Yeah. They're embodying the very things. Yeah. right? So all I'm doing is coming alongside and confirming it. Yeah. But if you have somebody who's just 
completely mm-hmm. um, inactive and uninvolved and um, lacking initiative and so forth. Um, and then you think by giving them a title that that's going to turn things around. It, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. It just makes a lot of people very frustrated and bitter. Right. Yeah. Yeah, even to, to your point, I was. it reminded me of the story of where um, I think it was the widow women that came up to the apostles and they needed need. I mean, they had needs and um, they had to pick people that had a track record of this, this, that, that's the good. other. Yep. And that's kind of what brought about leadership. So That's right. Yeah, that's really good. That's good. Yeah, I love it. And I, I definitely think that we hear the cliche, I think, in the business world a lot of like, you know, dress for the job you want, not the job you have or act, act like that, but fake it till you make it. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's, and it's interesting that like those have become cliches in a way that we kind of take for granted, but that if we view through like the proper perspective, especially as like believers, that those can really be things that the father can use to further us, like in the journey that he's planned for us. And that taking, taking authority in what the father has given us and honoring him in that is something that's good to whereas like, it's not something that that authority needs to be given by those people who were, I should say the authority to act admirably and be lead, be a leader and influence individuals in a positive direction doesn't need to be something that someone needs to like, crown you with or right. something like that. It needs yeah. to be something that the father places on you and that you honor him with that. Amen. One more quick thought. How do you avoid um, looking at people's imperfections in light of making a decision of putting someone in a position of leadership? Cause we all have our own little things, right? How do you avoid not just seeing that person for that, but seeing them for the good that the whole that be, they are, the whole that they are, right? Yeah. How do you avoid not just focusing on that? No, that's a that's a good question. I think you got to be in touch with yourself. Mm. If 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 I'm honest with myself, I know what it took to get to where I'm at. You should be able to be in touch with your own shortcomings and how you are still able to um, achieve or arrive at where you're at. And Mm. therefore, if you were to apply that same measure to yourself, so there's a degree of self-awareness too, and honesty, right? Um, if you were to apply that same measure to yourself, you wouldn't have had a chance. You wouldn't be where you presently are. So sometimes with time, you kind of weed all of that out. Mm. Like as you get older, you just, you learn to have a more sober assessment of people. Um, I remember when I was recently converted and, you know, I'm, I'm a new believer and so forth. I was very cutthroat because, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm on fire yeah. and, uh, I want everybody to arrive. Like apparently I did. Right. And I want everybody to get it, quote unquote, if you will, like I did. And I just didn't leave any room for time. <laughs> and it was very hard for people to be around me because I was very intense. Mm-hmm. Right. So that was me. Um, and it was genuine, it was great, and it had to do with, you know, the fact that I had tasted and seen that God was good, and I had a chance to have a new opportunity to live again, mm. and um, it's it's wonderful to feel like you're getting a second chance in life, right? Um, but the problem was because I wasn't tethered, I wasn't groomed, I was still in development, I had a lot of room for growth, I'm very new. Um, I was rough on the edges. and But as you grow and see life and live life and you have to live with yourself and be in tune with yourself, you end up having more of a, you don't water down standards. You're not soft. You're just, you're more honest with about, what's going on with others, what's going on with yourself, and what this looks like as far as this process of development. And you realize that the way that you're, if, if, even if you do see a problem with someone mm-hmm. that concerns you, the way any of that is going to be addressed or changed is by people like yourself being involved, right. not by dismissing them, mm. right? Because um, if that... 
if that continues to be the response that someone like that gets, they'll never have a chance to come out of whatever you're noticing right. about them. So somebody has got to take the chance with them to be able to work with them. So I think for me, it's not so much that I see that someone has flaws or shortcomings. It's how teachable are they? Um, remember, you know, trust, honor. So mm -hmm. are they willing to learn? Are they willing to grow? Do they have a desire to, to hear? Because if that's there, then, you know, the rest is just a matter of time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because it's interesting. Uh, this verse came to mind because you brought it up in a Bible study that you had at the house earlier this week where at, so, at some point Jesus does give us permission to brush our feet mm -hmm. and move on to the next city or things mm -hmm. like that. And so it's an interesting decision and, and dynamic to kind of know when that is and understand like the boundaries for that yeah. of which, I mean, I don't know if any of us know perfectly. <laughs> I yeah. certainly know I don't, yeah. mm -hmm. but it is something that, yeah, through thinking about it and through discerning. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it depends on what we're talking about too. So I think mm -hmm. certain positions of leadership require, there's this notion of being above reproach. Yeah. Right. And I think there's a reason why you see, you know, moral failures or disqualifications, even in ministry or among pastors or in the church circle, right? Mm -hmm. And I just leave outside of the business world. Um, and I think there's something to be said about the standards of ethics, integrity, and so forth, because especially if your position involves people and relationships and trust with their private information, with their personal lives, and so forth, these are very vulnerable, transparent transactions. And therefore, if your character is not up to par, then it calls all of that into question because mm -hmm. so much of what makes it work rests on character. Yeah. Right. And therefore, if, if, if so, it really depends. So I think we need to have ways in which we help people emerge by not placing on them positions that are are too intimidating yeah so they have time to grow to be that right mm -hmm. and i think you can cover them and, and and protect them but as far as certain positions that are um more more visible and more weight rests upon i do believe that there needs to be standards um because it jeopardizes everything we, we, we talked about. Yeah. And I even heard you mention the word business a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> earlier in the podcast, I believe you said Pathy was a, a startup <laughs> plant, not a startup. That sounds <laughs> kind of weird. Um, what what are some, if you could see, uh, what are some similarities and, and differences between planning a church, starting a business? Because I feel like a lot of the same principles that we could take in these are applicable over here as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, good question. Um, with a church plant, or and with a church, um, obviously, it's a spiritual body. Um, God is the one who is creating his church. He's building his church. He's the one who's who's. Um, you need people to, in order for it to be a true church, people have to be truly converted, mm. right? So they have to come. They're not just customers right. that can interact with what your business offers no matter what their condition, mm. yeah. <laughs> right? Whereas in the case of a church, a church isn't a church simply because you pack a room with bodies, right? That's an audience, mm. yeah. a group, right? You have a bunch of those all around town. No, a church is a living organism where the individuals that comprise that group are filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm. They've passed from death to life, right? They're in right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think they have a common confession. You know, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Matthew 16, right? So they have a common confession con concerning who Jesus is and what he's accomplished for them. And so I think that's... That's what makes a church is that we're baptized into this one body. Now, in terms of like the dynamics mm -hmm. that go into it, yeah, there are there are similarities in that. 
you know, even as a church planner, there there has to be a sense in which you you, you uh, I've I've seen this. You have to have an entrepreneurial spirit. Mm. You know, an entrepreneur or entrepreneurship is all about seeing problems and and finding solutions. Right. Yeah. Right. So you that that makes you come alive mm. when you look at problems that are not addressed yet. You want to find solutions. You look at pain points in people's lives. Mm. You you want to bring help value, right. right? Solutions to people's lives, right? So I think on, on that level, uh, you know, the, an entrepreneur is a grinder. Um, nothing is there for you to just inherit, mm. right? So you're starting from, you're not just walking into something and there's a transition right. mm, yeah. of, of leadership. You're, you're actually building something from the ground up. So that means you need to be, you need to have vision. You need to be able to see something before it exists, mm-hmm. You, you need to have drive. You need to be able to have delayed gratification. Mm. You need to be able to uh, run on a very low overhead. You have to be able to go without what a typical long existing entity um, is able to enjoy. Right. Mm-hmm. right? Um, and so that's, that's very similar to an entrepreneur it, w- with regard to a business startup, you have to be a risk taker. Mm. You have you you can't be stuck in one way, right? The methods may change, but the mission never does. Mm. But you you have to be malleable, flexible. Uh, you have to be someone who um, is both an introvert and an extrovert, especially. Mm. You have to be a, a people person. Um, you got to be someone who's for the city, engaged in the community. You, you, you have to be able to know how to enter into relationships and manage those relationships, right? That I think in, in many ways, there are similarities. Right. Um, there are similarities there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I love it because one of the things you brought up in terms of value, like that's something that really hit me a couple months ago is – like in terms of business entrepreneurship and you can um, apply it to church planting if you wish, but where I think if someone is doing some self inventory, some self examination, and if they figure out that their motivation for entrepreneurship is to create the most profit for their shareholders or whatever, rather than, first priority being provide the most value to their clients. Like that's something where I think there might be some like incongruence there and something that isn't going to last. Like that's something that that's striving for profit. Like there's so many, not so many, there's some like very cheap ways and very short ways to, to make a profit. Yeah. And I think a good amount of entrepreneurs, like that's, they think that they're striving to create something that is going to leave a legacy or that is going to pr- provide value. But in re- reality, they're just trying to find like a quick way to fame. That's right. And I think it's attractive to people because we see that happening over social media a lot, especially with this whole TikTok stuff, which mm. are you on TikTok? Let's not talk Good. about that. Uh, uh, oh, wait. Excuse me? Let's, let's, not, <laughs> Bro, let's not talk about that. Because I, I, I know I'm not. So if mm. you are, we might need to have a sit down. After this. Not over the airways. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you see these people blow up with like a million followers over the mm-hmm. course of like two days. And that exactly what you're talking about, that instant gratification that they kind of seek for mm. is so interesting. And so for anyone who is out there there's a lot of young adults who are entrepreneurs and that are trying to do things in life. And a lot of people who listen to us are entrepreneurs. Um, yeah. Like do a self inventory every now and then like Definitely. see what your true motivation is Definitely, and, and kind of what you're doing. So I think we'll take a left turn here because I know we got a heart out here in a few minutes. And we want to honor your time. So we want to talk about, you hinted at it a little bit earlier, uh, Ethiopian, mm-hmm. proud Ethiopian. And was, Ermias, was he Ethiopian? Eritrean. Eritrean. Eritrean, yeah. Yeah. So we want to get him on soon, talk about his culture too, Mm -hmm. because we weren't able to the first time around. But we want to, something that we do on the podcast, as you know, is highlight other cultures and really talk about the uniquenesses of them. An idea that we have is that God places a unique part of his character in every culture around the world. And that's part of the reason why 
each ethnicity and culture and tribe is going to be represented in heaven. And so from there, like the more cultures we're able to get to know, engage with the more of the father's character we get to know. And so what we would love to know is kind of what do you think are the positive parts of Ethiopian culture that are unique to it or that just American culture doesn't have that you think we can learn from? And then as a follow up to that, what what do you think the cultures can learn from one another, like Ethiopian culture from American culture, American culture from Ethiopian culture? Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, these can easily overlap, of course. Um, mm-hmm. But if I can just speak about some of the positive things about, you know, the Ethiopian culture, family obviously is right up there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a collectivistic culture. Mm-hmm. So it's not an individualistic culture. So there's a sense in which there's some value in the decisions that you have to make in life, you do so with a view toward the community or the family, mm-hmm. the circle that you represent or that you're a part of. You're not just this lone ranger. You're not this maverick. It's not just you. There's a sense in which you you recognize to whatever extent the implications that any decision that you make have on the people that share life with you. Right. So that's, that's good. You know, that, that's a value. Um, I think there's also um, a sense of honor. It's, so it's a, sh- it's a shame in honor in society, <laughs> but I think it's also an honor, mm-hmm. honor. Uh, there's, there's a sense in which um, you learn and you appreciate how to honor those that precede you. Um, you're not quick to dismiss them. Um, there's a sense in which you want to preserve that and, um, the best of the culture seeks to find ways to bridge the two generations and to not disregard one generation hmm. for, for another. So I think those are, those are great values. Um, the food is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the food is great. Um, just how far they're able to go as a community without a lot of the things that we think we need to be able to have, a, to be happy, mm. right? So it's amazing when you look at the culture to see like, oh, okay, they're, you know, it, it's amazing how much it itself can offer that to a person. Um, and so that, that is, that's always nice to be reminded of. Uh, because it it allows you to be strong, you know you have a center, and you know what you can go without, right? It's it's kind of nice. We over here we have to do fasts. Mm. I'll fast from social media. I'm right. going to delete my app. I'll <laughs> fast from this. I'll fast, but it presupposes we have all this stuff, mm-hmm. and we're 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 mostly you know hooked to it, connected mm. to it. But uh, it's it's just kind of nice to be able to. To see, to see a culture, of course, you know, a lot of these things are are everywhere that we're talking about. So I think I think those are those are great. Um, I think some of the things that the values that I've learned in the West of yeah, time management is what I learned from the West. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. <laughs> oh man, we need to work mm-hmm. on that. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, don't let me even get started with weddings <laughs> and church services Jeez. and. You name it. It's like time is 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 a a whole nother essence. But in any case, I praise God for the West yeah. and what the West has taught me about time, um, and <laughs> also um, I think about we talked about risk taking. We talked about entrepreneurship. We talked about all these things. You see, what happens is um, in a lot of cultures in the East. I could also speak for Ethiopia. They're 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 very conservative, mm. and one of the you. But in any society, you need the liberals and you need the conservatives. Yep. You need conservatives. You don't find your entrepreneurs typically yep. from the conservative side. Mm. So, but if if you're you're too much of one, then you lack the values, you lack the the norms, the anchor, the roots, yep. the foundation. To be able to build anything sustainable, mm-hmm. right? So, so, so that's important. So, but at the same time, if 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 that's all you have, you don't improvise. You can't adapt. You're not ready for the new era. 
Mm-hmm. You're not a pioneer. You're not seeking to enter into uncharted territory. You're you're going to be a laggard. You're not mm-hmm. going to be early adopters, if mm-hmm. you will. Yep. If my entrepreneurs hear mm-hmm. me out, right? <laughs> so if the iPhone came out in 2004, you're going to get it in 2010. <laughs> you know what I mean? Goodness. It's like, um, so I think, I think that's, so, so I appreciate a lot of the conservative side of things, the best of the conservative side of things that the culture um, offers. But then in terms of the West, what the West has been able to achieve and offer and contribute and bring, you know, uh, I value uh, the best that it has to, to offer. Yeah. And even just to the point of, um, you know, we've spoken about entrepreneurs and things and those kind of individuals. And I'll be remiss if I didn't ask this question. Um, a lot of times I encounter people that are in search of this calling that God, especially believers, right? I'm speaking of believers. Believers have, they're like, what am I called to? What does God want me to do? And it's, um, it's almost this thought that God wants you to be a president. And so I need to focus all my energy towards this. And I feel like in a lot of people, that's kind of where their minds are geared um, in trying to figure out this calling. But going through the word, I don't see that. You know, I, I see more so you're called to be a disciple, whatever you want to do, do it, <laughs> you know, glorify God, and, mm-hmm. yeah. but be a disciple, be a light. The emphasis are more so on those type of things versus this calling thing that we do. Like, how do you speak to a young adult or somebody in the church or somebody you just come across that mm-hmm. is so fixated on this calling that they're trying to figure out that they're not even doing nothing at all? Yeah. Yeah, um, I think that's true. It's it's very similar, if I can, to the whole with relationships. Mm. You know, how do I know I found the one, right. one, one, <laughs> right? Like there's this one soulmate out there. Mm. And my life's journey is all about finding just this one person. It can't be anybody else, this right. one person. And I think sometimes the same way we could make the mistake of treating relationships and potential mates that way Mm -hmm. i think we could do that with um our calling Mm -hmm. as well i mean we're called like you said beautifully first and foremost to god god has called us to himself through the gospel and um and next to that we're called to pursue him and so if i'm single that's my calling if i'm married that's a calling right i don't even need to Lose sleep over it. Yeah. Right. Mm. If I have children, I'm I'm a parent. That's an, an, an you can have multiple callings. Mm. It's an it's an additional calling, right? So Paul talks about in First Corinthians seven um, that we're to remain in whatever calling right. that we're we're in. If we could do something about it, then go on ahead and do so. Right. And of course, in that immediate context, he's having to deal with one thing. But I think the principle applies. In, is um, what's interesting is this whole concern. Mm. is this generation's concern. It's a very novel, recent, relative to human history. Mm. Um, During the lifetime of Jesus or the apostles or the early church, or even throughout the medieval period, especially when vocation, vocare, which is where the Latin comes from, to call, vocals, Mm. right? It's where we get vocation from. What is your vocation? That was something that it's a luxury to even consider All of these things. Mm. People simply set foot into whatever they were born in. Right. Whatever dad or mom or whatever was near them that they that they can do. You you didn't have this opportunity to kind of pave your path Mm. and and almost craft it in some sort of way. Um, This is something that is a luxury that's afforded to to people today. Whereas before people had to find meaning and significance in in other things than surrounding whatever you were doing because it wasn't it was menial whatever right. you were doing yep. <laughs> right um of course luther did contributed greatly in his book on vocation and calling when he rescued uh the church from this sort of sacred secular divide mm. where you're truly called if you're a monk or a priest <laughs> right everything else is just work and he talked about the the milkmaiden Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how, and he tied that with scripture, and how God feeds 
and provides drink to his people. But how does he do it? He doesn't just drop it from the sky. It's, it's the young la- maiden who, who goes into the barn and kneels down and milks the cow and brings it in and takes it through its process before it's bottled or contained in some way that someone could eventually enjoy. Right. That's how he feeds. Mm-hmm. It's that whole process. He, he talked about the, um, he talked about the, the shoemaker mm. and how he makes shoes so that people can have something to cover their feet with and, and how God clothes us. And he, he was able to point to the farmer. He was able to point to the, the shoe craftsman and the milk maiden and talk about the priest or the monk at the same time. Mm. Right, so he's he's showing us that God is able to be found in His calling in all of these things. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love it. I wish we could sit here all day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Talk. It's been. It's been great. It's been awesome. Um, but we want to honor your time. We know that you got a schedule, mm-hmm. as you noted, so you got yeah. things to do. Um, so if you want to take a minute just to plug your podcast yeah, and sure. everything that's coming up, yeah, go and do that. No, yeah. Um, well, uh, podcast is Joy in God podcast, mm. and um, it's you can find it on virtually um, major all major. Uh, platforms, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and so forth. Um, but what's new and right around the pike is uh, the YouTube channel, Join God. Uh, so we're going to add to the podcast a video component. So mm-hmm. I'm really excited about that. And that's mm-hmm. right underway. And um, looking forward to that. Yeah. 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 We're excited for that. Yeah. I mean, and, and I personally, I know this is our first time actually meeting, but, you know, I've seen you on the Bible study a couple of times. And one thing that I've noted is, I'm like, man, this is this is Pastor Neb. Yet, in his responses, in his engagement with those that are there, it's not a feeling of I'm the pastor and you guys are here for me and type of deals. Like I'm doing community with you guys in the same time, and for me, it's such a humbling thing to see. Mm. Right, whereas you could come and just lead and direct however you want, but you've, as we talked about earlier, you've entrusted, you know certain individuals um, and they're leading and doing such a phenomenal job and just having you there for me is like, wow, would you look at that? Right. And, um, and so Praise I just God. wanted to, you know, bring that up. You know, God, I, think, I think that's an amazing thing for me to personally witness. And as Chase mentioned, there's, I have so many questions I want to ask, but I can't do it. So I will definitely have to, uh, uh, do this again another Most time definitely. for sure. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Appreciate we'll, we'll have a round two coming up soon for awesome. sure. But uh, yeah, thank you again. It's, it's been a couple years in the works. <laughs> yeah, there it goes. <laughs> it's awesome. We can get, uh, get some time. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, that'll be a wrap for us today. We'll put all of Neb and his podcast information in the description so y'all can go check that out. Go support him. Go support the church and everything he's doing. All of our information will be in the description as well if you want to support us, um, support the outreaches we're doing, everything like that. But yeah, it's been fun, y'all. So until next time, much love and God bless.